Good morning. This is May 4th, 2015, and I'm Donald Rubenstein, the Jackson County Land Use Hearings Officer. I'm conducting a hearing this morning on file number 439-14-00780-ZON, which is an application for a lot legality determination. The property in question is located at 4321 Royal Crest Road. It's also described as tax lot uh, 500, Township 38 South Range 1 West, Section 13. And the application has been submitted by Richard Stevenson and Associates, Richard Stevens and Associates, uh, for and on behalf of Sarah Sales as an attorney representing U.S. Bank and A. This is an evidentiary hearing, the purpose of which is to determine whether the applicant has presented substantial evidence in support of the application. The evidence must address and satisfy the approval criteria which have been set forth by the Planning Division staff in the notice for this hearing. The approval criteria are also found in the following Jackson County Land Development Ordinance section, which is section 10.2.1a. If you feel that other criteria apply as well, you must raise this issue to me for a ruling, and I must specifically rule that the additional criteria apply before you may direct testimony and evidence to any such new criteria. Prior to the beginning of this hearing, I have reviewed a packet of information which consists of 18 exhibits. These exhibits constitute the record to date. I would add that I also asked staff to provide me with two recorded documents that are referenced by a recording number in the record but were not included. The documents themselves were not included and I'm going to add these into the record and for everyone's uh, information. These records are identified as um, 7604540 Title Memorandum sale and 7605102 titled um, uh, addendum to land sale contract evidence and testimony offered during the hearing must be directed toward the approval criteria you must raise an issue or an objection with sufficient clarity and detail to allow the participants an opportunity to respond and to allow me to rule Failing to do so will preclude an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. State law requires the applicant to submit all documents proposed as supporting evidence to the Planning Division prior to the hearing. If additional evidence or documents are provided in support of the application during this hearing, any participant is entitled to a continuance for at least seven days. Prior to the conclusion of the hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence or testimony that request is made, we will discuss the alternatives that are available to me at that time. If you desire to testify, please be sure to sign the public registration sheet attached to the clipboard, which is here on the dais. If you need to sign it, please let me know. We will get it back to you. And provide your name and address so that we, meet, we may have a complete record of those who have testified. This hearing is being recorded in the event of an appeal, in which case it may be necessary to transcribe the recording. For this reason, it is important to speak into the microphone, adjusting it before you begin to be sure that it will pick your voice up well. Please start your testimony by introducing yourself with your name and address. Please do not make oral comments unless you are in front of the microphone. And we will start with a report from staff. Good morning, Mr. Hernandez. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Francisco Hernandez. Senior Planner, Jackson County Development Services, offices at 10 South Oakdale Avenue, Metro. Um, so the long and the short of it is, it's staff's opinion at this point, because we're in a hearing, that um, the nine tenths acre unit, um, I guess, described as the north west corner of the south half of lot nine, Royal Orchard Track number three, is a separate unit of land. Separate so, lawful parcel. Separate lawful parcel. Thanks, sir. Um, staff accepted the uh, findings of the agent, um, agreeing that because those lot boundaries created by 
subdivision plat are not vacated, then the, the series of conveyances um, ultimately establish that 9 tenths of an acre separate parcel uh, with the creation date of December 1 of 72. So, um, as I uh, understand the record, what started out as lots 4 and 9 of uh, this portion of the something orchard uh, subdivision in 1912, that one, Royal Orchard, uh, they, uh, each of them was divided in half by a platted street, Duchess Lake. Is that correct? Yes, sir. north south. Let me north south. So that there were four parcels, four lawful parcels in there because of the presence of that planted street. You're talking about four parcels post um, conveyance by contract at North South Division? No. no. I'm talking about as those lots four and nine were created with the planted street running down the middle of them north-south, did that create four lawful parcels there? No, sir, it's platted as two lots, number four and number nine, each of about nine and three quarters acres. The, the um, platted, publicly dedicated right of way um, <coughs> separates, separates those two units. Okay, well, I know that uh, the applicant's agent I believe he argued that there are actually separate parcels in there, uh, and I don't know the extent to which that's critical for my determination, but I would like to get it In any event, the, uh, that's, that planted street was ultimately vacated uh, by the county, and apparently imperfectly, according to Mr. Stevens, as I recall. Um, and then in 1972, those two parcels, those two lots, four and nine, were in single ownership. The owner entered into a contract of sale for the north half of that. And then by a recorded document, a document recorded in 1976, they amended the contract for sale to include substantially all of the south half of four and nine, excluding what is now tax lot 500. Yes, sir. Okay. I have it straight. Thank you. Um, so I am now going to ask for a uh, presentation uh, by the applicant. Uh, and I'm looking at the list here, and I believe it's going to be Mr. Stevens. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Rubenstein. For the record, my name is Clark Stevens with Richard Stevens and Associates, and we are, we are located at 100 East Main Street here in Medford, Oregon. We're here representing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, U.S. Bank uh, through their attorney Sarah Sales on this matter for determining lawfully um, creating this parcel of land, Tax Law 500, and. We are in agreement with staff and their report, and I don't have a whole lot to add at this point. I would like to defer my comments and towards the rebuttal, mm -hmm. and I'll be happy to answer any additional questions at this yeah, point. Yeah, let me let me ask you to clarify the, the answer to the question I just asked Mr. Hernandez about what the impact of that platted street was, that dedicated street that was Duchess Lane, I think, ultimately that's since been vacated. My recollection is that in your fi proposed findings, you argued that that actually created two lots out of lot nine and two lots out of lot four. The 72 contract yes. created, yes, two lots out of lot four and two lots out of lot nine. How, how did it do that? Um, can we get Elmo <laughs> up and run? But uh, it, it'll be easier to probably explain it. But if we go to page, let's say, 44 of the record. OK, I'm there. Well, actually, maybe even, yeah, 44 is a good place to start. You'll see lot 9 is between 
let's say west of Duchess Lane and Lot 4 is oh, east of Duchess me. Lane. I had them oriented in the opposite direction. Um, and I'm assuming you have a color copy. I don't, but I don't know. I, I mean, I can see quite clearly. Uh, okay. So lot four and four, lot nine were, were actually separated by Duchess Lane. Correct. I see. And then the nineteen seventy two contract conveyed the north half of nine and the north half of four to the buyer, or it obligated the buyer, it created the opportunity to purchase, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yes. North half. Okay. Right. I just So, and that's how we came up with the four parcels um, created from those previous two subdivision lots. And this is based on the 72 contract, the original, yeah, and minus the addendum. Right, and the addendum, the addendum purports to sell all of the south half of four and the south half of nine, with the exception of lot five, the tax on nine. Correct. Okay. All right, so yes, you'll have plenty of time for rebuttal uh, because we need to understand what the applicant's issues are. So don't go away. So at this point, uh, may I call upon uh, the appellant, uh, Dr. Magruder? Are you going to make the presentation now, or is Mr. Arshan going? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Terry Magruder, and I live at 4307 Royal Crest Road. I am the owner of Tax Lot 505, which is was part of the division that created the residual Tax Lot 500. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak today. And I do want to say I am not um, against the uh, lawful parcel. I have several questions um, that I want to go into here. Um, I did want to clear up a statement that was made in the application on page 17, um, where Clark Stevens said that we refused to sign authorization. We worked with Clark Stevens and Sarah Sales for many months, and the questions that I'm asking you were the ones, and I have an email that I sent to Clark Stevens, uh, were my concerns, and I felt unable to actually sign the application at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. My concerns regarding the contract law was can an addendum to contract change the creation date of the parcel to a previous point in time? Um, I am submitting the following opinions and findings regarding the division of the two parcels under review. 381W13 tax lots 500 and 505. In 1993, there was an exception area staff report, which is when we first learned of the possibility that uh, tax lot 505 was uh, not lawfully created. Uh, the staff report st states that tax lots 500 and 505 do not appear to be legal parcels. 2001 was a lot legality review. Pages two and three, this planning staff report states, at the time of creation, no approval from Jackson County was required. However, the tracks were required to comply with the lot area and lot width standards of the zoning district, which was residential on five F5. And, and this is referring to those standards in effect in what year? In uh, 2001 was the review, but they were referring It was in 76. They were they were looking at uh, the division in 76 that was the addendum to contract. Mm -hmm. uh, the zoning district required that each newly created track be a minimum of five acres in size. This division did not meet the minimum lot er area, therefore tax lots 500 and 505 were not legal separate tracks. In 2002, there was an opinion and final order uh, the hearings officer states that in 1976, after countywide zoning, 
applicants sold all but 0.9 acres of their remaining 10 acres by addendum to the 1972 contract. The 1976 contract had the effect of creating a subject property. Tax lot 500, 0.9 acre, and tax lot 505, approximately 9.1 acres. During the hearing, uh, the hearings officer was John Eats, and the attorney for the applicants was Alan Harper, and they discussed whether the addendum to contract could change the creation date from 1976 to 1972. At that time, which would have been 2002, they commented and agreed that it could have been an intent of the addendum, but it did not result in a partial creation date of 1972. So let me let me uh, ask you a couple questions. First of all, what was the matter that Mr. Eads was hearing at that the time? The legality of tax lot 500 and 505. And how did that come before him? What was the impetus for that? That in 2003, we asked about the law legality of 505 because we had gotten the exception in the staff report a few years earlier. So the lot legality was our application. In 2002, it was uh, tax lot 500 asking um, to have tax lot 500 be considered a lawful with created parcel. So it's basically what we're doing here. And what was the determination that hearings officer Eads, Eads reached with respect to tax lot 500 in that case? That it was uh, not lawfully created at that time because it was created in 1976. And that's my question. Does the addendum right. of the contract go back in time and um, merge with the contract? I, I understand your question. It's a question I have independently. Um, so would you be kind enough, please, to give me the, uh, are you going to provide a copy of Mr. Eads' decision? Yes. I don't think. I'm providing copies of all five uh, opinions and findings that I have here. Thank you. Uh, then in 2008, there was an order granting partial sum summary judgment in the circuit court. The court's analysis is the same as that of the county, hearing, county hearings officer the split of old tax lot 500 in 1976 created two illegal parcels, tax lot 500 and tax <coughs> lot 505. Both tax lots were required to be a minimum of five acres when they were created out of the private split in 1976. Um, also in 2008, we have an affidavit from Alan Tara, who was the planning <coughs> and program manager for the Jackson County Department of Roads, Parks, and Planning Services. Tax lots 500 and 505 are the product of the 1976 land division that created two parcels not considered lawfully established. So that was my concern. We have gone through several years and had several findings, and mm -hmm. this finding is different, and I'm hoping that it is correct. Okay? In 1976, tax lot 505, which was approximately nine acres, met the minimum lot size of five acres as required by county-wide zoning on five and five. The defect in the property was the result of two small parent parcel, tax lot 500 at 0.9 acres. Or as then county council Steve Rankle explained to me, the county does not recognize the property line adjustment between the two lots. It's an invisible line that does not exist. Um, and my final comment is, if tax lot 500 is found to be a lawfully established parcel, and I hope it is, then the defect in tax lot 505 is gone. And if the planning department's tentative approval of the application is confirmed, I am requesting that tax lot 505 also be found to be lawfully created. Um, and one last <coughs> request is if we could keep the record open for 30 days to if there was any other things that could support the addendum to contract. No, we, we will certainly talk about that before the hearing. Okay. So let me, let me ask this question because I'm frankly confused now. 
you you have appealed the determination that it's lawful, but you just said that you are hopeful that I will determine that 500 is lawful, even though you have appealed it. Right. And, uh, and you have um, <coughs> raised a question relating to the effectiveness, the legitimacy of the addendum to actually create what it, uh, are now tax lot 500 and 505. No. What my question is, what my clarification is, and I'm asking you to clarify, can you take the, I agree, 1976, we had these, this invisible line that created two parcels. Can you take the addendum and go back in time and say that the Creation Act occurred in 1972 as opposed to 1976 when it did occur? That, that's my question and I wanted that clarified. We've worked on this for a lot of years with the county. I wanted to make sure that it was right. absolutely correct. All right. Well, uh, I think you raised what is probably the central issue in this entire matter. It kind of leapt out at me as I reviewed the record. So, anything further, please do provide those documents and testimony <coughs> to uh, Mrs. Harris. So, Mr. Archambault, do you want to add something to the appeal? Yes, I do. Go ahead. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Glenn Archambault. I'm at 4307 Royal Crest Road, Medford, Oregon. Um, and to clarify, I'm a landowner of the properties in question, 501, 505. And I also have, as the county's always described me as being a partial owner of 500. Um, if you read the record, you see where they say there's one parcel, two owners. Um, <coughs> Mr. Rubenstein, I'm going to offer this to you. If there's something I can clarify or help with, we've been at this for since 1993, so we're pretty knowledgeable about the facts on this. I'd like to just quickly go over some of the decision points and <coughs> points of contact about this property. Um, Back in the 80s, the people that sold me the property were confronted by the planning department. They said this is an illegal lot. Sorry, this was, who were your sellers at that point? How was it Phyllis Osher? That's what was the Osher's. It was the same people who had yes. purchased from, yeah. And, and if, if, if it helps, Chloe Small was <coughs> the actual owner. They were a contract to him. They did not have a deed. Um, when we bought the land, the land was reviewed intensely by a real estate attorney that we knew well, uh, as was the county reviewed it, and no one brought this issue up. Um, as soon as we bought the property, the week we bought it, in fact, the next morning, the county code officer confronted us and informed us of a number of issues, one of which, the illegal law. This was 1980 what, sir? That was in 1993. The, the point is, is that their position was that it was an illegal lot at that time. Um, the land use review that was sent to all the landowners in that area, other illegal lots, uh, was very clear, and we can give you a copy of that because it's the, the point of that is that uh, it was very clear <coughs> of the county's position at that time, and they had appeared to have spent a great deal of time looking at these illegal lots. It wasn't just an off-the-cuff decision. Um, and in 1995, all of this land was condemned under a FERC action, and at that time, the company Pacific Gas and Electric reviewed all of the land intently. And the reason they looked at this is they saw defects in title, division, and that concerned them because they needed to have everyone subordinate their interest for their energy project. Um, so these people also agreed this is an illegal division. Um, from 1993 to the present, I've contacted every elected official that's ever represented me, including the governor of the state. We've discussed this issue. They all said the same thing. It's an illegal division. Um, in a civil case against the sellers of the property, which was very long and involved, went to the Oregon Court of Appeals. The judges at the Court of Appeals said, we're sorry, it is an illegal division. And who brought that issue? Or that and Was it the, uh, the Osiers against the Smalls? No, it was we sued. Howard and Phyllis Osher, and indirectly, 
Chloe Small. Um, he was not named in the case, but it went to the Oregon Court of Appeals. And what were you seeking? It, at the Court of Appeals? Yeah. Well, at all. What was, your, what was the nature of the suit? The suit had a number of issues. The main issue in the end of the case was only <coughs> to do with the illegal lot that they sold us. And in that case, as Dr. McGruder pointed out, uh, in a motion for summary judgment, Phil Arnold, our, our, one of our local judges, found that in fact it wasn't a legal division. And I would have you remember, he is a real estate attorney, quite knowledgeable guy. Were, were you seeking recompense? Yes. I mean, we're, and we were hoping to find a way to resolve this, because even if they were uh, successfully sued, we still had to resolve the issue mm -hmm. of the illegal law. Mm -hmm. um, And let me just ask you further, did you pursue the matter to the money judgment? Yes. And so you collected damages? We did not. Um, a jury found that we had no loss. And so at the end of the trial, um, and that was probably the most minor point, there were major points made in that trial that discussed the illegal law and some of the contract <coughs> and what went on around that issue. Um, I think my main point, Mr. Rubenstein, is that we feel that very competent legal people have looked at this issue um, and looked at it for a long time, and no one has ever brought this forward before, that you could go back in time and uh, adjust this situation. Right. I understand the point. A, a very key item that took place was when they were evicting the owners of Tax Lot 500 one year. The county was evicting them. Um, Doug McVeary, who was county counsel at the time, and at that time state representative Judith Uberlaw, um, who also was an attorney representing the, the people who owned Tax Lot 500, they had a great dispute back and forth, and we have some of those letters, and um, county counsel says, no way, no how, this is ever going to become legal to um, Mrs. Uberlaw, and they <coughs> left it at that. Um, I'm going to agree with Dr. Magruder on this point. We don't, we, we would like to see that tax lot 500 become legal, but the real question here is what becomes of the rest of the land? And I want to make sure you understand that we surround this property, this parcel, if it becomes legal and we do not become legal on the same day, we are going to be on very unequal footing. Um, and that wouldn't be an issue if we weren't dealing with Auckland Financial. Uh, they're a global lender, they own the property, um, they've been a very hostile party to this. And so I know that's not your issue, and I know you're on a very narrow focus here, but I'm not. I have to deal with the real world around us. What, what, uh, what is the size of your parcel, 505? 505 is roughly nine acres. It's unsurveyed <coughs> land. With, I would add, I think everyone in this room, everyone that's dealt with this would love to see the day to have this come to an end. But we don't know this is the right route. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak in uh, opposition to the application? <coughs> All right. Clark Stevens is yours on rebuttal. Yes. Clark Stevens. Um, there's been a request for continuance, so I'm going to keep my rebuttal brief, and I'll probably do it more in writing for a uh, uh, related record. Yeah, we'll leave the record open. And I, don't, I don't want to continue the hearing. I would close the record. We'll close the public hearing and leave the written record open. Um, but I do want to make a couple of comments in regards to Dr. Magruder's uh, statements there. And I think all the previous applications that were submitted and reviewed um, had the starting date of this 1972 contract as far as how these reviews were looked at. What we did here is we actually went back to the original subdivision that 
gave us these numbers <coughs> of parcels. And that's how we came to four separate parcels. And then could you have done a lot line adjustment? I think um, on, let's see on page, you see 136, uh, the county surveyor, you know, looked at that and, and he's, gonna, I'm going to say he's in agreement that the lot line adjustment or property line adjustment standards were not in effect at that time. However, because of the addendum, that it's actually part of that, you know, they just changed the legal description that it's still in effect based on that 72 contract because it wasn't fulfilled. And, you know, we can probably clarify that a little bit more um, just to make sure everybody's, you know, clear and simple with this. But uh, the extent is that the south half actually <coughs> created three separate parcels at that point in time. So you have 500 and then you're going to have the east west side of 505. So the three parcels, let's be very clear about this. And then I do, before I forget, I would like you once again, because this still is not clear to, me, to take me through how four and nine are in fact, prior to 1972, that they were four parcels, right? That's well, they were only two parcels prior to 72. And in 72, the Smalls entered into a contract for deed with the Oceans <coughs> to sell off the North Half. So that two, two. Okay, I got it because I'm thinking about the Morian in one way. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, you, I interrupted you. Well, that's fine. Go right ahead. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the three parcels are basically the south half of lots four and nine. And you have tax lot 500, and then the western portion of 505, and the eastern portion of 505. All right, let me get to a map so I can see um, 44 again with page 44. Now we argued that it could, Hold on, let me get there and just nail this so I don't have to keep wondering. So you are describing three parcels in the south half of lots four and nine. One of them being the, the south half of four. Another of them being most of the south half of nine, and the balance being tax lot five. Correct? Oh, look, it does not work. Yeah. Uh, we're strictly looking at the south half of lots four and nine. Right. And I see your. Uh, characterization of, the, of there being three parcels there, mm -hmm. and two on the north. Right. Again, because they're not, four and nine are not contiguous, they're separate, you know, again, in 1972's our point of reference at this point. So, um, that was a paper street, a public road in between lots four and nine. So, when with the addendum tax lot 500 became its own separate parcel with that creation date of December of 1972 and then that road created the remainder of 505 east and west as separate parcels because they were already separated and that road, the Dutchess Lane, is on the plat? Yes, it is. Can I see that? So I'm, Mr. Hernandez has just handed me uh, a very official looking copy of that plan. Oh, I see you submitted it. It's too big for it to have been included in the record. Okay, so this is Royal Archer Track Number 3. Uh, and it was filed July 23rd, 1912. Just let me orient myself to these parcels. Four and nine. And there is a platted unnamed street. Between the two. 
So I think, you know, again, based on the county surveyor planning staff, um, our opinion that 500, 505, or, you know, I mean, we're just going to focus strictly on 500, that it uh, was lawfully created in 1972, and this is confirmed by the land division rules in effect at that time by the county surveyor. We've had numerous discussions with them about the rules in effect ORS 92. Um, talked with staff about it several times and just to make sure we were on the right page on, and the same page in making an application. So, um, and then as far as Mr. Archambeau's comments that his due diligence or that Jackson County didn't provide him information, um, I can't um, argue with that. I have no clue what was provided to him, uh, what all the lawsuits and judgments and everything. All I can say is everybody was basing day one as 1972 versus 1912 and really follow the um, whole chain of events. Um, Dr. Dr. Bruder raises the question, and I think it is the essential question, is whether the creation date for 505 is 72 or 76. Um, let's, let's go back for a moment to your characterization of this as a property line adjustment. Mm -hmm. Your uh, submittals indicate that there was no property line adjustment process. It wasn't a concept that was existed in land development ordinance until 1982 or 1983. So what you are saying is that this is sort of in the nature of a property line adjustment because there were no property line adjustments, essentially. Correct. It is, uh, if it's effective, it is a contract uh, for the reconfiguration of parcels that were in separate ownership. Right, the addendum was a reconfiguration, a, a new legal description for the transfer. Right. So that's how we were looking at it as a concept. Um, and that, you know, if you want to look at it in 1972, you had four separate parcels with, with that contract. And that the, the, each, of those, each of those four separate parcels was roughly four and a half acres. Yes. A little more than that, 4.675. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> so if you looked at it as a property line adjustment, you then could see that you would have uh, tax lot 500 and then tax lot 505 as still two separate parcels being on the south half. Um, still remaining with four original based on the 1972 contract. So, um, you know, th there's multiple ways you can look at this, and we gave a feasible rationale. I think the county surveyor say, was saying, um, you know, based on his standing, it, we didn't have property line adjustments but it was a land division in actuality based on the rules in effect um, in his uh, world of dealing with ORS 92. Um, I still think you can, you know, if it's separate and legal and you can re readjust uh, the boundaries, um, you know, that's all it is. It's just a reconfiguration with the same creation date of 1972. Mr. Archambeau also mentioned that uh, the property is unsurveyed and prior to the rebuttal I thought we submitted a, a boundary line agreement that was done but 
I don't recall seeing it. Okay. And I know the difficulty in that neighborhood um, based on discussions with the county surveyor and Mr. Archambeau's, um, you know, there are no fixed positions or a basis for a beginning for legal descriptions. And um, so it is a, a difficult situation to create a survey um, on the property, but I know there was a boundary line agreement that was conducted um, back in the day. And we can provide that. And also, if you do provide that, please tell me how you want me to regard it. Like you want me to well, it's just a comment, and sure, as that it's unsurveyed at this point. Um, I, don't, I don't think that presence or absence of a survey is critical here. Um, go ahead. Well, that's all I have at this moment. Okay, so what I, what I want you, what I urge you to do is uh, these two documents, which I ask staff to provide me, 7604540 and 7605102. 7604540 is a memorandum of sale, and it refers to the December land sale contract between Small and Osier. It says that the deed, uh, uh, I'm adding language, but this is what it says, the deed that was uh, required to uh, be delivered upon fulfillment of the contract was in fact fulfilled. It was in fact delivered. The contract memorandum of sale, it basically says the sale has concluded. Then some days later comes 760 Four five four zero five one zero two and and and, uh, and also seven six zero five one zero two, which are the addendum to the nineteen seventy two land sale contract. And to be honest with you, they trouble it troubles me the addendum. Uh, Dr. Magruder asks whether, in fact, the addendum can, in fact, lawfully relate back to 1972. And features of 7605102 and 7604540 disturb me because they relate to property that is completely different from what was the subject of the initial land sale contract. They deal only with the South Africa for that. They establish a separate purchase price for that property. They establish financing terms for the South Half. And ultimately, when you take them together, they establish uh, when interest starts to accrue and when the initial payment under this addendum must be made. And all of these events are in 1976, all of them. The only thing that's not 1976 is the date that is recited at the top of the document, December 1st, 1972. But 7605102 and 76056, Hang on. We have three documents. Two documents. The addendum comes in two parts. One is 7606345, which is a re-recording of 7605102. And it says that it was re-recorded 
to due to an error in the legal description and to and the addition of a beginning date on interest. So these documents are signed in 1976. They were notarized in 1976. They are recorded in 1976, and they purport to amend or provide the an addendum to a 1972 contract which the memo of memorandum of sale at 76050540 says was fulfilled. It says that 1972 contract was fulfilled. We gave them the deed. That's it. It's over. It's done. And then come along several weeks later, we're going to amend that contract. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's this is a very tough legal issue. I don't know how to get around that. Okay. We'll take a look at that. And I think, I think your analysis and research you've done is extremely good and very thorough. And then there is this thing just staring back at me. And it says, we have a 1972 contract. In March of 1976, it was fulfilled and the deed was delivered. And then in April 1976, that contract reportedly was amended. And that's tough. I mean, it seems to me that contract was fulfilled. So, okay. That's a tough issue. That. So. so, let's talk about the record. Um, we have a uh, statutory deadline of May 18th. Today is the 4th. I know we're not going to make that. I hope uh, attorney sales in the U.S. Bank is agreeable to Because otherwise, you're going to have to take the rip right now because there's no <laughs> way I can make that. No. Um, so, uh, what uh, you want to provide additional document in rebuttal in response to this, right? Correct. Okay. So you're looking up there. Yeah, I'm just looking at my calendar. Um, so. Oh, you're there, looking at your calendar. Yeah, 30 days is what uh, Dr. Magruder requested. And, uh, I believe that's uh, fine with us. And then if we go seven and seven for. Um, rebuttal to submit its information and seven days for the final rebuttal. So let's line this out. So we have, and I'm going to ask Dr. McGruder if this is okay too, 30 days, which I will call the first open record period, which is available to either party, both parties, to submit evidence and argument uh, that is relevant to the application. And so that would be 30 days from today is the 4th. That would be the 154th day of the year, which would be Wednesday, June 3rd. So substitute Dr. Magruder's contentment. We're going to extend, we're going to leave the first record period open until Wednesday, June 3rd. And then seven days for the second open record period, which will be available to both the applicant and the appellant, but it is limited to the submittal of evidence and argument in response to whatever was provided during the first open record period. You can't come back to this hearing, you can't come back to other portions of the record. You're just, this is your opportunity to respond with evidence and argument to what was submitted by the other side during the first open record period. So that would then continue until June 10th, which would be seven days. And then a final open record period of seven days, which is available to the applicant exclusively for rebuttal. And at that point, you can submit only argument, no additional evidence. If you submit additional evidence, it will be excluded from the record by law. And that will then continue until June 17, 2005. Now, a word about the open record period submittals is that they need to be delivered physically in hand to the planning division by or before 4 o'clock on the date that the open record period closes. Fax transmittals are unreliable, as are email attachments, and we have had trouble with that before. 
and it is simply a rule that they have to be physically delivered by four o'clock on the date that the uh, that the record that open record period concludes. And if you are submitting color exhibits, photographs, or whatever, please submit two copies uh, because otherwise the color exhibit ends up in the official file in the planning division uh, files, and I don't have them. I get a plain black and white copy. So there we are, uh, and we need now to figure out if your client is going to extend the 180 days. And yes, I, I presume you are, because otherwise we spit out. There's no problem. Okay, so um, as you recall, I have until I think it is roughly the 14th of June, somewhere in there, on the matter that I heard last month. Um, so, let's see, I'm going to make this go on forever. But, uh, so this record closes on the, fourth, on the 17th. I will be out of town that weekend and the 4th of July weekend. So, would you be comfortable extending to July 31? July 31st, mm -hmm. that'll be fine. Okay, so Mrs. Harris will be, and we still have that time uh, within the statutory limit, Mr. Hammonds, for not cutting up against that period. Three hundred and sixty-five days from the date the application is complete. Oh, no, we're fine. So then, if we can extend the my deadline to July thirty-first, sign the document that I see Mrs. Harris has in her hand. All right, so before we conclude, Dr. Magruder, is that uh, period of open, open record opportunities agreeable to you? Okay. And for the record, Dr. Magruder said yes, that it is. Okay, so with that, I am going to close the hearing and I will leave the uh, written record open for the periods we've just discussed for the purposes that I identified. Thank you very much. <laughs>